Welcome to this second session in our series of videos on OpenAPI. Uh, Zuplo is launching support for OpenAPI natively in our gateway this week. And to celebrate, we're hanging out with some of the biggest celebrities and influencers in the API-verse. Today, we're lucky to be joined by Phil Sturgeon. Uh, we hung out with Daryl Miller, who's one of the editors of OpenAPI yesterday. And Daryl actually called out Phil as one of the people who helped get OpenAPI 3.1 over the line. Phil also is a staff author at APIs You Won't Hate and one of the hosts of their, their podcast and has a blog post on just about every topic related to APIs, living with OpenAPI. Um, every time I ask Phil a question, he's like, he just sends me a link. Um, so I thought it'd be great to get into some of the realities of living with OpenAPI, some of the things you can do with it um, with Phil. Before we do that, Phil, tell us who you are, what you do as your day job, your relationship with OpenAPI. Let us know a bit about you. Yeah, thanks for the uh, thanks for the brilliant introduction. Um, so yeah, my name's Phil Sturgeon. Um, I've been working in and around um, the API space for quite a long time, and and kind of specifically with OpenAPI a lot for the last couple of years. Um, oh, it's been a really long time. Started playing around with it in like 2016, and and realizing it wasn't quite doing everything. I wanted to do. And uh, as with open source projects, you end up getting super involved, sending pull requests, getting on getting on meetings, um, sorting things out. And then I uh, got so involved that Stoplight, who would make a bunch of tools, they were like, do you want to just come work for us? Because you're, you're already doing a bunch of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, go on then. So it's <laughs> just increasingly over time, got more and more involved with the world of open API. And yes, yeah, since then I've been writing about it and helping people set it up so they can use it as a superpower in their organization to, to solve problems. That's awesome. And so that's your relationship with OpenAPI. I know you're active in a bunch of projects. You've always got like seven irons in the fire, but what's, what, what else is taking up all your time in the, in the day? <laughs> um, well, I, I've got a lot of random jobs, but um, I run a reforestation charity called Protect Earth. Um, we're restoring ancient woodlands and cutting down invasive species. Um, but yeah, I'm working on a new book at the moment. Um, it's a old new book. Uh, I, I started working on it a while ago, but then um, you know, trying to fight the climate crisis got in the way a little bit, but um, now, I'm, <laughs> now I'm back to working on the book. Um, I've just been editing it uh, all day, working on it. So, All right, come um, on, let's plug the book now. Let's do it at this point. What's the book going to be called? Uh, it's called Surviving Other People's APIs. Um, and is that audience allowed to see... Oh, sorry, is the, is the audience <laughs> yeah, allowed to see that? <laughs> I'm currently using it as the stand for, uh, you know, the only stuff. But yeah, this is the very scrambled up thing, and it's, um, yeah, basically just... Discovering other people's APIs should not be like an Indiana Jones experience where you are dodging um, pitfalls and, and flying arrows and trying to decipher cryptic runes. It should be, you know, should be easy for people to work with. And, and if it's not, here's how you can go about it. I love it. I love it. And delivered with the humor as with everything else you do. Um, okay, <laughs> great. So so you saw it here first, uh, audience, the, the, the cover of Phil's book. So make sure you go and pre-order it on Amazon. We'll stick a link uh, in the notes. Yeah. Yeah, we'll stick a, a link in the notes. So getting into the, the stuff we want to talk about. So um, in our discussion with Daryl, we talked about, we introduced OpenAPI, what it was, and what emerged was there's like many use cases, actually. Not everyone is sort of using OpenAPI for the same things. You know, some people are doing linting and testing and all of these topics that I know are, are, are subjects close to your heart. And I wanted to talk about, um, you have a great blog post about this about this idea of design first, which Daryl introduced us to um, yesterday. He talked about it being like a useful way, particularly if you have like a Jedi council of APIs, you know, you've not written the code, so you're more willing to change it. Um, but we didn't get to get into a lot of detail. So I wanted to explore with you, you know, how, first of all, how would you explain design first versus code first to, to someone who's not super familiar with these spaces? And then we'll get into some of the, like, the realities of, of working in that space. Yeah, I mean, the API design first workflow kind of goes by a lot of different names, um, depending on who you talk to or when. It's not a particularly new idea. Or some people call it contract first or schema first or description mm -hmm. first or whatever. Um, the idea is that, yeah, before you start writing a whole bunch of code um, and, and feel pretty attached to it and maybe get it into production where changes are much more hard, uh, difficult to make, you you kind of build your open API much sooner on. Um, instead of, you know, you can write all the code and then just going to go, oh, wait, we should probably have some docs. Ugh. And then you just kind of fudge some open API out so that you have documentation. Um, instead of doing that, it's about the open API being brought 
brought to the very first thing you do or not not the very first thing you, you go through your planning phase um which is where you kind of uh, you engage stakeholders to talk about what the needs are and you kind of go through requirements docs and all that sort of stuff and, and maybe you start doing some diagrams and mirrors but once you've got past whiteboard stage then you get into um you know designing this open api uh, description and um yeah i mean whether you're just kind of using a text editor going at it uh, by hand, writing a bunch of YAML into a text box somewhere, or whether you are using a GUI and clicking a bunch of buttons and getting some help doing all that. Um, the idea is, yeah, you can really quickly iterate on it. You can you can um, generate mocks very early on. You can generate docs to see what the API would look like if you happen to, to build it. Um, and that can get you a lot of feedback that people can then use to feed back into the process to go, well, actually, that request and response looks rubbish because it doesn't solve my problems or I'd have to yeah. make 100 requests to solve this problem or I, you know, there's too much data in there. And that's going to be really slow. You can start having real conversations um, before you've built a bunch of code and wasted a bunch of developer time, which is expensive. I mean, that makes sense. We've actually felt this ourselves. You know, we're we're so into APIs given what we do. And we have some APIs, right? We have our API that sits behind the web product and APIs that people use to manage API keys and so on. And we made, we kind of made this mistake. We just like built it. We talked about the best practices that we liked and how to build like what we call restish design. And then it's only when we're using it, we're like, oh, that's not consistent. And that doesn't look like X. And it's, you know, it's really hard now to make those those changes. Um, so actually, but can you contrast that a little bit with code first? What does code first mean to you? Yeah. I mean, literally, you know, you write all the code and then someone says, oh, we need some sort of documentation. So if you build the code, you don't have a mock server. You just run the server in a development mm. environment with an empty database or whatever. Um, and you, um, you don't kind of you don't think about linting the, you know, the API to see if it's applying to a style guide, because it's just code that wouldn't work. You have code style guides. So it, the idea is that you, you've written all this code and then you just kind of go, oh, well, should probably do some docs because someone asked for it. And then you either add like annotations to the code or you kind of just like squint at it and, and type a lot um, and try yeah. to get it close yeah. enough. But it's, it's all about kind of making open API later, which is then just kind of this um, potentially incorrect artifact um that was you know never right um that can then also age and so even if you did get it right the first time it's kind of getting less right over time but um i mean that i am sold so i'm sold on the the the, the that's probably not the optimum way you want to do things like it's better to have a discussion you've got something tangible that people can look at and you've not started like crafting class files and and so on yet before you start making changes um but you know what's the reality of living with this you know if i can be honest my experience of it when we first tried this was yeah we said cool let's do this we built an open api doc everyone agreed we'd we'd done it great looked awesome and then somebody wrote some code Realized in writing the code that perhaps like the design wasn't, you know, we hadn't thought through a few things. So there had to be changes. Guess what? The changes were made in the code and not in the open API doc. And we had this kind of drift. Like how is, how is design first done? Well, like what are some of the, like the core rules? I know you've done this at a, a few places. I think it was WeWork one of them. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, from in your content. Yeah. yeah. So I'd love to know. Yeah. How, how do you think about the best practices here? And what, how, how do you actually get it to work? Yeah, that's, it's, why I started using OpenAPI in the first place, I was basically seeking some sort of API description um, format that I could use as a workflow that covered kind of every step of the way. Um, and OpenAPI uh, 3 wasn't quite there. Um, it had some like incompatibilities with JSON schema, which was good at some points of the life cycle and not others. But <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, uh, long story short, there's, there's a lot of different places where OpenAPI gets involved. I wanted to find one source of truth um, for all of it, because as soon as you start having multiple sources of truth, things start disagreeing. Um, and so you've got, you know, you've written a bunch of tests and you've written a bunch of code and you've written a bunch of validation rules and you've written a bunch of docs and, and all of those sources of truth can really easily get out of date. You know, postman mm. out of date. everything just gets out of date over time. Um, and so trying to find one thing that would do it all was kind of the idea. And so there's a version of the design first workflow that people were pushing that was a little bit that kind of ended you up back in that same situation where your code and your um, uh, and your open API are diverging. And so that, mm. I, I call that in the article, um, 
API design first, then code first. <laughs> um, <laughs> because you basically go through this period where like we're in the design phase and we're figuring out what it's going to be. And then, you know, once we're all agreed, we're going to be done with design. It's going to be time to build. And then we just yeah. throw that thing out. And whether you like run it through a generator and, you know, generate your code to start off with or, um, or whether you just kind of go, oh, all right, well, that just sits over there and now I'll do this code stuff. Um, yeah. Either way, you know, once you're working on version 1.1 or a new endpoint or a new feature, you're kind of, well, I've got the code. Oh, that open API is a bit out of date. There's no point using that. And you've got back to that code first um, workflow. So what I've been trying to push for the last couple of years is the um, API design first and evolve, um, where you use that open API, um, you know, design it first and then use it for mocks and docs to get your feedback. And once you're out of that design phase, instead of writing loads and loads of code that repeats all of the sources of truth for all the validation rules that you just wrote, you can use mm. open API validation in your actual production code. So you never wrote that thing that disagreed with the open API. You just used it and it, and it provided you with server side validation that saves everyone time and money. Um, and then, you know, you, you start looking at your tests and you think, well, we should probably write some unit tests or some integration tests that, that check, um, the response is returning what we think it is. And so in the past, people have written these massive test suites that are like, and the email address should be an email for a <laughs> string. And this thing can be null, but in this instance, it shouldn't be. And, um, and this should be a date and this should be whatever. And you end up writing your contracts again in the test suite. And why bother doing that? You can just write a single assertion that says, hey, does this response match this other thing? And so now some folks used to spend loads of time like with documentation tests using tools like Dread to make sure that their document their documentation wasn't lying. Um, but now you're making sure that your contract matches your code. And so you're you're forcing those two you're forcing that single contract to be true in all the places and you, you don't have that divergence of different sources of truth. Interesting. It, it paints this picture again that I, I mentioned to Jarvis there. Like open API can kind of sit at the center of a wheel with spokes coming off that like turns on a bunch of lights. Like, hey, it can help with testing, linting. You mentioned so many things actually that we should try and unpack um, there. And the more of those you do, it seems like the more likely you're going to have the discipline to, you know, to keep that thing up to date um, and, and truly stay design first. Like that being like at the center of your your universe that drives all of those things, uh, like even SDK generation actually was something we were chatting about with Daryl briefly um, yesterday. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Uh, actually, I want to—I just want to go into one thing though. You said you said documentation tests. Oh, yeah. What is that? What does that look like? <laughs> so there was a tool called Dread, um, which uh, was—I um, forget who made it. Um, Spelled like Judge and, Dread or the word Dread? Yeah, Judge, or... Judge Dread, um, okay. D-R-E-D-D. -D. I think it's been discontinued. Yep. It was by um, Apiary, um, who were, you know, early yep. brilliant player in the in the kind of hosted mm -hmm. documentation game. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was basically, it started off around API Blueprint, um, which is kind of a predecessor to, to Open API in, in a lot of ways. It's been discontinued now. But the idea was that you, it, it got open API support and the idea was it would look at your open API file and go, okay, I'm, I'm looking at all these, these endpoints. I'm looking at all these URLs here. I'm seeing, I'm seeing some uh, examples for, for your requests that I could you know probably send, or um, mm -hmm. I'm seeing the scheme or I can, I can make a, a, a sample request. I'm going to build all that up, fire it off at some local host server that you've got running. Um, and then when the response comes back, I'll make sure that at least all of those properties that say that they're required are there and that like they're a string if they're meant to be, and it's, you know, close enough. And so what I would do is say your documents aren't complete nonsense. And <laughs> some people would <laughs> use that as API testing, which it really wasn't. It was just kind of, it was just very loosely trying to say, if I try and make requests based on what your documentation says, does the server fall over completely? Um, but yeah. there was a huge amount of work that went into making those tests actually work because you had to seed all of the data and because it wasn't really a proper data, uh, 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 a testing system like you and I as, as programmers would probably think of it. It wasn't yeah. resetting database transactions or doing any of this complicated yeah. stuff. So you just do like all of your gets and then all of your puts and then all of your posts and all of your deletes in order. 
hoping that you know you wouldn't delete something here that you then need yeah. to my hands about you know in case anyone's listening to this i don't know what format is going out <laughs> but, <laughs> it will um, be a video but maybe people will listen to it anyway i listen to a lot of youtube fantastic. stuff so yeah but uh, well then i'll carry on waving my hands about but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah basically you just kind of have all these like things leaking through from different requests and it just meant it was such hard work to do it like you'd you'd spend a, a month trying to get dread testing working or a week or whatever it depends how busy you are but you spend a bunch of time on it and then um, you really proudly announce that your API now has, you know, this documentation test to make sure that you can never have your API and your uh, code get out of sync and you've enabled it on pull requests. Um, and it's, you know, required on, mm. on GitHub or whoever. So you can't deploy unless your API and your open API totally agree with each other. And then after about a month, it's breaking more often than it's actually working. You're just getting really fed right. up. You turn it off and it never comes back. So right. you're just wasting time to do this extra thing that ends up not really adding any benefit. And that's why I kind of gave up on that approach. You'll see blog posts from me recommending that. And then you'll see blog posts from me going, actually, yeah. um, <laughs> because <laughs> this, this approach where like open API is simply an assertion in your normal unit test suite or integration, integration test suite. However you go about doing your tests, it's just an assertion in that. And you have all of the power and all of the, idiomatic stuff that your language and your framework of choice have so it's all you do is just assert at that test level that i mean that makes sense and it sound, i mean it's I, mean, I guess i'm trying to conclude here that you're saying that it didn't work this whole dread that there's too much there's too much kind of nuance in the actual workflow of an api that that doesn't make sense to just run through docs and randomly fire requests based on your documentation <laughs> it kind of needs some understanding that that certainly makes sense to me um absolutely so what would you what is the recommendation instead then like c concretely um it's a difficult one people still ask for tools like dread because they want they want to have their open api file and then bung it at a tool like one run run one command line where you just have you know thing and here's my open api file and is it is it good or not and they just want that kind of yes no from a single command line you can't necessarily really get that um, and it doesn't really provide that much value. Um, using whatever test suite you're already using sounds like a brilliant answer, brilliant answer to people that of course already have a test suite, but it sounds awful mm. to people that don't already have a test suite. And honestly, mm. if you don't have a test suite, set up a test suite. You, you should do that. You can't right, right. easy your way out of this with a single command line. It's not going to work. You set up some basic hello world. I'm going to ping these URLs and see what the responses are. And once you've, once you've done that, It'll take a little while, but it's okay. Um, but then you can start to get real um, excellent with with kind of sending different combinations of parameters and, and checking different responses with different data and different scenarios. And then you have a functioning test suite. So like if you're scared of testing, you've never done it before, just dip your toe in with getting all the URLs and seeing how that works and sending a few posts and see how that works. Um, and just assert, you know, just run a little assertion. Most test suites whether it's Jest, PHP unit, whatever it is, whatever language it is, somewhere there's a, a testing um, tool that will help you say, and the response that comes back, does that match this schema in my opinion? Got it. And it, and so, it will let you know what the problems are. So this is where this idea of validation comes in, where you can apply some kind of validation layer that's looking at the traffic coming and going from your your API and then can itself make assertions that say, you know, Hey, this request didn't, didn't meet the standard or this response didn't meet what was, what was expected. Um, I gotcha. is that, yeah. is that for, yeah, kind of looking at traffic that can lead people to think different things, um, where contract testing can come into play in a lot of different parts. Mm. Um, if you have a, you know, think, super simple you're writing some code you've got some test suites in that uh, in that repository um what language do you normally use what do you prefer uh typescript typescript cool so you're writing some typescript you've got some controllers for your web framework and then you've got your test folder over there and it's got yep. just running or whatever and when you run that just test suite it will you know probably not unit test, probably integration test. You know, it pretends yeah. that it's making a request to your controller and then it responds yeah. and says, here's the body, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so you use a, um, something like AJV, for example, in, in JavaScript world, um, yeah. it's a, a JSON schema based validator and open API and JSON schema, are, um, compatible, um, which was a whole long story in itself. But, um, uh, yeah. So the, the, the schemas that you're making with open API is JSON schema. So, 
um, you can you can bung that JSON schema into a JSON schema validator and then say, hey, this response that I got back, does it match? And so that's just in your test suite. So that whenever you got can, it. you know, okay. guest test it, it does it. Um, but there's contract testing doesn't have to be in unit tests or, or integration tests. It can also be looking at live production traffic. There's loads of people who make brilliant tools. Um, Optic have some pretty cool stuff for, you know, actually, and, and um, Akira, Akita, um, I forget. They have brilliant tools that will look at your actual production traffic and go, oh, hang on, that doesn't match the thing. Um, and so yeah. then you can have the choice of, well, actually, should I have you spotted a benefit? Should I add that into my open API or should I panic? <laughs> you can choose to panic um, if, it, if it doesn't match the contract. So contract testing can be done at a lot of different steps um, and things like prison proxy. I've used that in testing environments where all the traffic runs through it and it freaks out if it spots a problem. So do it different places. Got it. So Prism Proxy is a free tool. Is it from Stoplight, I think? Yes. Yeah. And it's a free tool you can use that is like a little proxy that sits and, and monitors traffic and looks for violations against Open API. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Prism, most people know Prism as a mock tool. It's a very basic mock tool. You just kind of point it at your Open API file yep. and it goes and it responds like a realistic-ish API. Um, but then the proxy mode is very similar. You can send requests in and it will, if they're invalid, it will error saying, what's that? Um, you didn't send this required field. This is the wrong format, something else. Um, and so you can have it either respond with errors or you can have it kind of like log them quietly. Um, and it will just mention them. It's a, I think in the response header somewhere. So you can actually basically just funnel all your traffic through. And whether, if that's a, uh, I, I did it at WeWork. We had this huge testing environment where there were like yeah. 20 different APIs all talking to each other and they were all talking to each other directly in this testing environment. And we just kind of like wrapped them all up with a bit of Docker Compose and had them talk through proxy. So A would talk to B through Prism proxy. And so those systems had no idea that they were being tested. Um, it was just kind of passing through in the same way because uh, they were all yeah. different languages. This one was Java, this one's Scala, this one's something else. Um, and, and so we just kind of passed it all through Prism Proxy and then started breaking the test suite when there was a mistake. And that really helped us hone in the quality because all of this was code first. Everyone had just built their APIs and put them into production for years. And then we were trying to get documentation and people were just eyeballing it. And so by running everything through that test suite, it meant we could really make sure that the, the open API was up to date with what people thought it was and what the documentation said it should be. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Actually, we're super excited about this. You know, one of the reasons we went open API native is so that we can we can kind of engage in in concepts like this. So we're already having conversations with customers about us having a, an environment setting that turns on open API validation for different environments you've deployed for the Zuplo. You know, maybe you just oh, yeah. turn it onto sampling mode for production. So we're not sampling all every billion API calls you do, you know, <laughs> um, but in your test or your development environment, you might turn it onto full, like, let's just look at everything and, and build those reports up where you're a bit less uh, latency concerned. So we're super yeah. excited about that. Uh, on that note, actually, another thing, and I think you mentioned this already, and it, it goes back to another uh, tool offered by the Stoplight folks is l linting. So tell me more about, about what, what linting means in, in, in the API world, how you do it. I know you've spent a lot of time on this. Yeah, um, linting can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and we struggled. Um, so we built this tool called Spectral at Stoplight. Um, I helped mm. a bunch with it. It was based on a tool that I um, built with uh, Mike Carlson called Specky, and it was kind of rebuilt by Stoplight and made you know given it more power. And um, I love the, the I love I, the sorry I love the etymology of these things. So it was called Spectral because it was inspired by the name Specky, I'm guessing. And they yeah yeah, yeah. and it was yeah, called okay. Specky because it was like it was um, automating the like well actually. Um, robot at your company. So <laughs> basically, um, I just had like this little logo, like super. Nerdy. Um, I love someone, it. You know, you, you're writing some open API. And it's like, well, actually, that's a really insecure way of doing things. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, basically, built Specky with my experiences at uh, WeWork um, because a hundred people trying to learn open API and trying to follow a new API style guide and trying to do all this stuff all at the same time was a lot. Um, I had a full mm. inbox <laughs> every time yeah. I just went to go and get something from the, the kitchen. It should be like, ah, Phil, huh? um, so <laughs> yeah, basically I kind of taught Specky to, uh, I taught this tool to, uh, to know what constituted good quality open API. Um, spectral at a very basic level will, will tell you whether your open API is valid. 
And some people thought that's not very interesting. Why is he getting so excited about that? But you can build your own custom rule sets. And, and those custom rule sets, again, I think they just thought it was like, you can do some weird nerdy technical thing where you, whatever. But really it was about building your, your own API style guides. Um, and I've now built loads of different, mm. um, loads of different kind of NPM modules, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if people know Node all that much, but it's a package manager. We can release these style guides on this package manager and then anyone else can use them. Um, and so we've got a, we've got a rule set, um, rule sets, uh, the technical name for the set of rules. But basically I built these rule sets for like OWASP security. So you can find out if your API is, is secure or not. Um, I built hmm. one for APIs you won't hate. So every single bit of advice I've given you in the book, I've tried to make a rule for it. So that if you start doing something like a really <laughs> bad idea, if you start using HD, uh, HTTP basic, it will say, probably don't want to do that. If you start using yeah. auto incrementing IDs, it will let you know why that will lead to your data getting downloaded. Um, it, it just, how do you know it's an auto incrementing ID? Uh, it, just if it's an integer, to be fair. It's Got it. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. It's like, you should probably use UUIDs or U, uh, ULID yeah. or something else on Snowflake. But, um, yeah, basically you can program anything into it. And so linting doesn't just mean, is it valid? It means, is it useful and, and is it good? And you can define what useful and good mean to you at your company and then package that all up and make sure everyone at the company is doing the same stuff. So whenever a pull request, pull request gets sent, you can run spectral to make sure that it's following the style guide and they've not done anything horrendous and they've, they've not added one um, endpoint, which has got like camel case for no reason when the rest of them look about case, you know, you can, you can enforce things that matter to you um, so that you don't have to waste the time. You mentioned like the Jedi task force of API governors or center of excellence or whatever you call them. Um, they can all sit around and spend, you know, five hours a day going, well, actually that should have been camel case. We better send some feedback for that. Or you could let a robot yeah. do 90% of the really boring stuff. And then you can have conversations around like the architecture of the systems that you're, des you're designing and whether they meet the business requirements. And is that the most performant way of doing something instead of just, you know, bickering about nonsense. And it also yeah. means that I didn't have to be the person saying it. Like if a robot <laughs> says, Hey, come on, you're not following the rules. We'd agree on the rules that, that that's much better than like you having to go around going, come on, Steve, you know, it just <laughs> gets fewer arguments that way. <laughs> There's a theme here that your laziness leads to uh, better automated systems, but uh, there's, a, there's a common <laughs> pattern. Um, so no, this Absolutely. is interesting. So, so how, I mean, how does, how do you write these custom rules? Are they hard to write? JavaScript. Um, they, they used to be a little bit quirky, but um, I've written a bunch of them and I've got some articles we can put somewhere. Um, if you have, you know, yeah, no, we'll put one. links at the bottom um, of the video. Yeah. Yeah. But I've open sourced a bunch of these uh, repositories and you can just clone them and, and tweak the rules. Um, the, the rules engine, um, you can you can basically use like JSON path selectors. That's the hardest part to figure out. Like JSON path is a whole thing, but it, yeah. it's kind of like a, like CSS selectors, but for, for JSON. Um, so you kind of, you, you point spectral, you make a rule that says, look at this piece of the open API file. And then you apply a rule, which it, there's lots of built in rules. So does this thing exist? Does it match a pattern? Does it do something else? Um, or you can write your own custom rule just in line, um, or load it up from a module, but you can write custom JavaScript that will then do whatever you want. So you could, you know, um, go and look in, uh, a, a, a dictionary or do whatever stuff you want to do. Um, so yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Well, uh, what, what are some of the, what are some of the edges, the, like limitations of what you, you have, you've struggled to do with linting that you wish you could? Oh, there's probably quite a few things. I mean, the, the OWASP security one was, was quite unfortunate because there's quite a lot of stuff in there that we can't figure out. Like we, we can't say that your API is secure because we can mm. see what your code's doing. It's, it's saying things like, um, you know, watch out for mass assignment errors, um, where you just take everything. I don't know what's happening inside your code. Watch right. out for, you know, watch out for old versions of TLS. Well, I can't really help with that. I'm not, I'm not looking at your, your code yeah. because it's only looking at the open API. It's looking at the surface level. Um, you basically use it to spot problems, but you don't use it to say you're fine. So it, it, yeah. That would be false confidence. Interesting. And I guess it's hard, you know, like we, we created a set of rules internally for designing our APIs. Like everyone has these like guidelines Like Microsoft has published theirs and I think Google's published theirs and so on. Um, but you can follow those guidelines and still create like a ugh, 
API, right? An API you will hate. <laughs> Um, yeah. and I guess that's also hard to automate. There's something like, there's some like nuance, there's some sense of art there. Maybe, maybe chat GPT four or whatever we're going to do. We'll, <laughs> we'll be good at reviewing APIs and, and giving you yeah. that sense of beauty. But is that, is that something that's hard to do with linting too? For sure. I mean, well, if you can define what you think is good or bad, then it will enforce it. So that is up to you. I think right. I've been trying to make these, these rule sets kind of smaller, um, in, in the past there was, there was like, quite a lot of people are using spectral it's at massive companies there's you know um like adidas and um i don't know why i'm blanking like azure and dropbox and um, yep. digital ocean and loads of these companies paypal azure all the banks um these big companies that have done it the italian government randomly um and uh <laughs> yeah people people just make like a rule for everything that they're interested in in their department and so there's a lot of, of, of yeah. overlap of you know, um, we're copying rules off each other and then the Italian government does a great one. I'm like, oh, I'll put that over there and it's just copy paste coded. But we're starting to kind of um, talk together a little bit more and come up with this idea of sharing packages. And I've made a, a basic list of all the different ones that are publicly available. There's a very early stage of like a marketplace for it. And that's, yeah. that's the end goal is to have a proper marketplace because um, you want to have people focusing on, on smaller, more modular p pieces of the puzzle. You want to have some yeah. people that make one that says, this open API is going to work in AWS gateway because they've got all their weird quirks about you can use this part of open API, but you can't use that. And you've got to have these keywords in there. So you can have another one that says this follows the um, open banking standards or the fire standards for healthcare. And then you have another one that says, and this works with JSON API or some other, you know, different data format. Um, and you have all these different parts. And then this, you know, this one cares about security and, and you can, you can use, all of those at the same time and have a bunch of different errors uh, come back at you. So hmm. yeah, we're trying to, we're trying to stop people from just like duplicating everything all over the place. And then so you can like give people Lego blocks. Yeah. 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 And you can that makes it your sense. unique, your unique um, perspective of what you think is, is good based on different random combinations. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That sounds awesome. Um, I'm excited to get into that more. Again, it's another thing we're excited about at Zooplo, people putting into their, their CI CD workflows so that, you know, we can, uh, we can help them lint their, their gateway definition and stop it going to production if it doesn't meet the linting rules, right? You know, the developers can ship anything, but actually to get it to QA and staging development and then to prod, like maybe there's different guards in the way. So we're pretty excited about that as well. So we've talked about a few things there, you know, code first versus design first, linting, all the flavors of testing from documentation to contract. You know, is there anything else, you know, on this like wheel of, wheel of open API fortune of like things people can do that are important and that are valuable that you would, you would add to the, the list of your favorites? Yeah, there's, there's, there's blooming loads that it touches. It touches pretty much every, every part of the API lifecycle, like you said. Um, I think that the API governance aspect is the part that I'm most excited about because people mm. t taking on some sort of API governance program for, for a company is, is fairly important. Um, you, you need top down level support that this company cares about doing API as well, about having a style guide about keeping that style guide enforced um, and about doing all this stuff. And that can be, that can be quite hard to get, but I've been the person in the corners trying to say like, Hey, we should do more of this open API stuff on this. Come on, guys, it'd be great. Uh, and, and that's, that's not very fun either. Um, Cause you're just, you know, trying to make progress happen. Um, so I think when an API governance program is, is done well, open API can be a really um, just helpful piece of the puzzle. Cause um, things, things like Stoplight have like shared design libraries that you can use if you gotta, yep. you know, get on the enterprise plans and stuff. But the idea that you can have people building, um, shared models that can then be used by lots of different people in different departments instead of them all redefining them. I think there was a, a flights company that joked that they had a hundred different models for a flight. <laughs> literally just a flight wow. and there was a hundred different combinations of that apparently you can do the same thing a lot of different ways um and so you know you can you can using things like shared design um uh, you know these shared libraries um you can define everything in your company and then you know you other departments can use those or so slight variations of them they can kind of like add a few more fields and kind of remove a few fields they can use that and then like other people could use your libraries and all of a sudden we stop wasting all of our time by like describing what an address is or what a person is or what a flight is or whatever. 
um, and work on, you know, other more important things. So I think a lot of this stuff sounds like it's more work, but it's actually saving a huge amount of time. Um, you know, yeah. the governor, the, the governing people can, can spend a little bit of time with the governing people, <laughs> the laws, um, but like <laughs> people can come together, decide what's important, decide what they want in their API style guide, and then never have to think about it that much again, because you've all just decided that that's how you're going to do stuff and everything's consistent. And it's not just a constant yeah. fight about how to keep to that, that thing. So that saves a huge amount of time. I, in I think you. Yeah, no, it's great. And, you know, I worked at Stripe where they had a, a Jedi Council of APIs and, and Microsoft had a large one as well. And, um, you know, that can be a fairly painful process and uh, details of like negotiating the right way to do X. What's what's really great, though, is the more of that you can automate. So the feedback to the engineer, um, you know, or the person creating the, the open API spec PM or whatever is really instant. It's like, you look, you know, you're off kills are here because you've not you know you're not meeting this like standard that's been documented in an automatable rule i think that's a very you know most people hate governance or most engineers don't like the the g word uh, at least when it's spelled with a capital so the more people can do to automate it with some of the tools you've talked about and remove all that debate i think it's a just a huge huge win um Phil, this was awesome. I think uh, we're we're at time now, but um, you know, we I could chat to you all day about this stuff. Um, thanks so much for for taking the time to to chat with us. We'll add lots and lots. There's gonna be a lot of links on this one because uh, we're gonna put all those <laughs> blog posts down there. Um, I might just send them to APIs. Fantastic. You won't hate, honestly. That might be easier. Yeah. But um, but um, we and your some of your spectral rules. I think it'd be great to to link to all that stuff. So so check out the notes. Um, thanks very much. And next up, we'll be talking with uh, Kevin Sviber, who's uh, one of the marketing leads on OpenAPI. And we'll be talking about, which should be fun, uh, some of the sort of the standards wars. You know, you mentioned Blueprint. We, we mentioned some oh, Raml yeah. and so on yeah, with Daryl. Yeah. You know, what, what happened there? Why did OpenAPI went out? And talking more about um, Kevin, as you know, works at Postman and um, talking more about his role on on. Um, uh, sort of a design first and how open API plays into that and his experiences working with customers there. So that should be fun. So yeah, see you tomorrow. Yeah. Cheers, Phil. Thanks cool. very much. Really Thank appreciate very much. it. Great hanging out as always. Thanks.